Well, it is Memorial Day weekend, and in my childhood, Memorial Day was a big deal because it marked the beginning of summer. School was usually out by then. Over on the eastern side of the mountains, the weather reliably turned hot, and our town held its yearly Dayton Days Festival, which was a big deal, too. There was a parade, a barbecue, rodeo, horse racing. It went on for three days. It was fantastic. But always, my dad would gather his high school students. He would take them up to the cemetery early Saturday morning to place flags on the graves of the founder of the school and many of the war dead. He did this not in a showy way, but in a grateful way to commemorate what they had done and to keep their memories alive with yet another generation. A few years ago, I read a piece by a retired Navy SEAL who urged that Memorial Day be not so much a time of celebration, but a time of commemoration, a time of remembering together. But every time it rolls around, I think, how can we possibly remember those who were supposed to remember this weekend, the, the, the people who died in wars for our country? Because the, the numbers of those who have died in war in our lifetime are simply staggering. How can we hold those numbers in the human container of our grief? U.S. war deaths in the last century totaled, give or take a few thousand, 633,810. Can you wrap your mind around that? I can't. So I was relieved when I read a column by Nicholas Kristof many years ago, the Oregon born and raised New York Times columnist, who pointed out that human beings are better at responding to the suffering of individuals than to the suffering of groups. In fact, quoting research done in the neurology department at the University of Oregon, it turns out that, in fact, we're psychologically incapable of caring for large numbers of individuals. In fact, human beings are able to be more compassionate about one child who falls down a well than about two children who fall down the same well. When I first learned that, it was like the lights went on. And I thought, oh, I'm going to try an experiment. Maybe you remember it if you were around here. Oh, I'm going to guess it was 10, 12 years ago. Rather than including huge numbers in the Memorial Day prayer, which kind of made all of our eyes gloss over and, and, and probably instilled guilt in us for not being able to feel what we probably should feel, what we did instead was we prayed for three Oregonians who had died in the war in Iraq. One of them, I remember, was a 19-year-old from Portland. He was an only child who, before he left home, told his mother, don't worry, Mom, I'll be in the rear with the gear. He was killed in a convoy accident during a sandstorm on the third day of the war. In his online obituary, his uncle says, he would have made a kind husband and a loving father. He was pretty darn cool. And that day we prayed like that on Memorial Day. I remember we sat here and sobbed. We can't begin to feel that level of emotion for the other some 6,789 who have died this century or the over 59,000 wounded, depending on how you count. But what we can do is focus on one. We can remember them. We can keep their memory alive. And in that way, we can appreciate the cost, the cost of asking people to go to war on our behalf. We can enter somewhat into that spirit of David weeping inconsolably for Absalom. Edna St. Vincent Millay, after World War I, wrote, down, down, down into the darkness of the grave, gently they go, the beautiful, the tender, the kind. Quietly they go, the intelligent, the witty, the brave. I know, but I do not approve, and I am not resigned. When Jesus was trying to appeal to the crowds to seriously count the cost of following him, he appealed to two common sense examples. And remember, he believed that they were very, very obvious examples. One, 
No one builds a tower without first counting the cost and making sure you have enough money to finish it. Imagine having a two-thirds built tower with your name on it. You'd be a laughing stock of the whole community, right? And no one, he said, goes to war without knowing you can accomplish what you intend to accomplish. If you can't, oh, if you can't, he said, you'd better work it out peacefully first. Common sense, right? Well, it doesn't seem so common because human beings have been going to war for centuries without figuring that common sense example out. We've been at war in Afghanistan since October of 2001. And we've been in Iraq since March of 2003. We're graduating a class of high school seniors who cannot remember a time that our country was not at war. Who can count the cost to that generation who don't even know a time that our country hasn't been at war? Who can count the other costs to all of us? Well, like I said, our brains can't absorb the number of lives lost, so let's look at some other costs, too. Let's look at dollars spent and what that means. Let's look at lives directly and indirectly impacted. About the dollars spent, talk about glazing eyes. Get ready to have your eyes glaze. It's hard to find current numbers, and believe me, I looked and looked. I did find that the war in Afghanistan alone has cost the U.S. $978 billion dollars through fiscal year 2020. Now, I don't know how much money $978 billion is. I suspect in about a week, Alvin Tong will send me an email telling me how high that would stack up to the moon and back and forth and forth and forth in $10 bills or something like that. And I will share that with you when I get it. $978 billion, though, in anybody's measurement is a tremendous amount of money. And since we didn't impose a tax to pay for it, we've incurred an extra $450 billion in interest on the debt, which is going to balloon considerably over the next 40 years. Some of you are old enough or have studied enough history to remember President and former five-star general Dwight Eisenhower using his retiring presidential address to warn us that military spending could crowd out spending on other priorities and weaken our country. And if we spend a few minutes meditating on that, can't we all imagine where $978 billion might have been spent? But of course you're thinking, well, military spending isn't just spending that goes down a drain, it creates jobs, it stimulates the economy. But studies, one in particular at the University of Massachusetts, show that if you take that same money and spend it on education, it creates twice as many jobs. If you take that money and spend it on infrastructure, it creates more than twice as many jobs. And those numbers I quoted don't count the cost of caring for returned war veterans. And that's a cost that peaks usually three or four decades after a war. The cost of medical and disability payments for veterans over the next 40 years is estimated to be more than $1 trillion and nearly everyone says that's not nearly enough. Because this war featured traumatic brain injury, which is an injury that's very difficult to heal and goes on and on and on. This war featured a tremendous amount of post-traumatic stress. It's double that of previous wars. It's horrendous to live with and expensive to treat. And the numbers are hard to pin down, but it looks like more veterans of this era have died by suicide than in battle. Many vets come back with something we're now calling moral injury from things we've asked them to do or asked them to see that transgress their deeply held beliefs and cast a shadow over their lives for decades. The theologian and Disciples of Christ minister Rita Nakashima Brock is now writing about and leading moral injury programs for volunteers of America across the country to help veterans recover from the trauma of moral injury. As a country, if we say we honor our veterans service and we honor their sacrifice, don't we owe it to them to get them the support they need? And not only military veterans, but the people who are going over there in droves as contractors. I talked to a neighbor the other night who said she has a former student 
who, who is suffering from traumatic brain injury and PTSD, who doesn't have insurance, can't connect with the VA because he's a contractor, and his only option he sees is to continue going over to the Middle East as a contract, contractor and then to heavily self-medicate every day. Some life that, that we're committing these people to. We can do better than that for the people who serve us. And while we're trying to count the costs, think about the other way our lives are impacted. Lives of family, of friends. Oh, I had this wonderful poem that former minister here, Jerry Birch, wrote. And it is carefully sitting, apparently, on my dining room table. It's a poem about his Uncle David coming back from World War II. And I will put it in the ATC this Thursday. So wait for that. But as you wonder what Jerry Birch said about his Uncle David, I'm wondering about how many of us have some kind of an Uncle David in our families. I had an uncle who came home from the war from World War II, from those island landings in the Pacific, and he was on the front lines. He self-medicated with alcohol the rest of his life, and who can blame him? Ugly family interactions resulted in a long period of depression for my father, which resulted in a long period of depression for my mother, and I was raised by two depressed parents as a fairly direct result of traumatic injury coming back from World War II. And it's taken me a good amount of therapy and spiritual direction to work through to the point I am. I know my story is not the only one. I suspect most of us have a story like that or two or three. And that's one reason why I continue to display a bumper sticker on my car that reads, I'm already against the next war. It's the highest tribute I can think of to veterans of previous wars to make sure that we hold a default position against going to another war, against putting our military's life and health at risk unless absolutely necessary. And I can tell you that it has seldom, maybe never, been necessary, at least in my lifetime. As if my lonely bumper sticker is going to accomplish anything. But what can we do? What can we do? The late Oregon poet and pacifist and conscientious objector William Stafford asked himself that. He asked himself that a lot. He said, I remember once taking a stand. Jesus couldn't stop war. Eisenhower couldn't stop war. Why should I blame myself for not stopping war? What I can do is do the things within my power. I can decide there is one person who won't be in it. That's a possibility. Another couple of possibilities. Remember, remember, that's what this weekend is for. Remember, and let some of the pain of remembering seep in and move you. Remember the young Portlander killed just three days into the war, or the family over on Walker Road with flags still out mourning the loss of their son. Remember the uncle or the grandparent or cousin who came back and was never right, never pain-free, and the impact it had on all around them? Remember and imagine it could have been otherwise. Jesus said in a very practical off-the-cup example, who, who would go to war without counting the cost? But he also said if you can't count the cost, or if you can't make the cost work out, you'd better make peace instead. Imagine that. Stafford said the question is not whether foreign nations engage in unfriendly acts. Of course they do. But why they engage in unfriendly acts. And whether we can act to reduce that enmity between us. Can we find other ways? There must be other ways. The ways we're trying aren't working so well, are they? Stafford's son Kim, also a poet, said, what if there is a new way to think about things just ahead of us? What if we open ourselves to the finding of the next idea, the new story, the new paradigm for human behavior? And what if it's available right here? Just like we've learned when surprised or challenged personally to take a breath and to pause 
so that we can respond rather than reacting, what if we did the same as a nation? What if as citizens we did that together, responding rather than reacting? What if we make a stand, open a public discussion, and then make the way possible for others to take that stand? Eisenhower's more complete quote was, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired, signifies in the final sense a theft. From those who hunger and are not fed, from those who are cold and are not clothed. This world at arms is not spending money alone. It's spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. Imagine the alternative. Imagine honoring our veterans with a different way forward. Imagine that this graduating class is part of the last generation that knows a life where we have only and always been at war. Imagine what else we could do with our resources. Imagine families not marked by the trauma of war. Imagine, imagine.